Hello, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our very first Brazil International Talk Show. I'm Suzanne Porson, and we are a team of Brazilian and Hispanic entrepreneurs that live in Florida and contribute to the development of Florida's community and economy. Our goal is to create a forum where we can discuss areas of interest between the Brazilian community and the citizens of the country where we choose to live. Now the hosts will introduce themselves. Aluizio Vasconcelos. Well, I'm Aluizio Vasconcelos, as you just mentioned. I'm the chairman of uh, Westchester Financial Group and uh, also chairman of the Brazil Foundation, International Foundation, and uh, I was a founder of the Brazil Brazilian Business Group, uh, all these last two non-profit organizations. Okay, very good. So now, Roberto Barroso, please. Good afternoon. My name is Roberto Barroso. Uh, I'm a retired city banker. Uh, I joined Citibank in Rio de Janeiro in 1971. In 74, I was transferred to New York. And uh, they asked me to stay and uh, did a career there. Although I left the bank in 1982, as Aloysio knows, to set up and manage the New York branch of a Brazilian bank, Banco Bamerindos. And of course, big challenge because we opened on the day that Brazil was at the Plaza Hotel renegotiating its debt. And I had a branch to, to operate. Very interesting. <laughs> Big challenge. And I left the bank three years later, profitable, and then went back to Citibank, where I stayed until early retirement in 2000. And then here in Florida, I joined uh, on the board of a small Mexican-owned bank in Miami. Uh, that is specialized in trade finance. Okay. And of course, I am a founding member of BBG, and I authored this, the first bylaws. All right. So now the other lady of the group, Marisol Gonzalez. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Marisol Gonzalez. I'm originally from Venezuela, and I'm the CEO for the Hispanic Entrepreneur Initiative. I have lived in many countries, four continents, and that international experience and the experience as an entrepreneur allowed me to bring it into the Hispanic Entrepreneur Initiative, where we join groups of Hispanic entrepreneurs, diplomatic corps, corporations, other economic development agencies, and we support the creation and operation of sustainable businesses in the U.S., specifically in South Florida. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Now it's João Barbosa. Hi, uh, my name is João Barbosa. I'm an entrepreneur uh, and CEO and founder of uh, JBB Par Investments, uh, an annual investment firm uh, based here in Miami. I'm also the, the vice president of the Brazilian uh, of the Brazil International Foundation and also a board member of the Brazilian Business Group. Uh, glad to be here with all of you and to be able to share a little bit of our experiences. Great, great. Back to me now. I'm Suzanne Thorson, founder and creative director of Brazilian Beat, a performing arts company. Uh, my field of expertise is Brazilian art and culture. I've lived in the United States since 2007, and we are based in Boca Raton, Florida. So, our subject today is entrepreneurship. I would like to ask maybe if one of you, Marisol, João, who has a story maybe, like, you know, of your past experience that you could share with us? Marisol, you want to start? <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, as, an, as an entrepreneur coming from a different culture, a different, not only uh, culture on how you live, but how you conduct business, how you meet people, it is a culture shock 
when you start doing business in the U.S. You may have the technical knowledge, but there are these little things that you don't know. And I remember one of the first shocks to me was having to do networking. In our countries, networking is a part of our regular life. You know, friends, family, they refer somebody. But the moment you have to walk into a room of 300 people with business cards and have to introduce yourself and give a 30 second pitch, you are out of your element. That was one of the first things that told me here, it is a different ball game. So I, I really believe people, when they come here into the US, they need to learn how to interact here, do the due diligence. Uh, I have a person that I respect a lot, Luis Ramirez on my board of directors. And he always says, the US rewards innovation, but punishes improvisation. And yes. to me, that is key. Awesome. Uh, you know, what I wanted to know if any of you can tell us a challenge, like something that didn't go well, you know, to, to give an example for, you know, the new people that come here. Can you share maybe as well? Uh, yes, I have uh, some experience uh, here with uh, trying to implement business here uh, in the U.S. and previously in Brazil. But just before, just a quick, uh, as the subject, uh, we're talking about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. Just I heard this uh, thing once, uh, and it, it, you know, like I always bring it as uh, a good, you know, like a, a description of uh, entrepreneurship, uh, which was, it, we basically can describe entrepreneurship in three words, which are like vision courage and competence so it's vision you know first word like it, it, it's different than ideas you know like vision is something that you know like ideas we have a lot of ideas but like vision is something that you know like bothers you and then you you dig into it to try to you know like to to understand to see if it's uh, uh something that makes sense to to move forward as a business you have courage as the second word and courage to transform that vision into reality it's something real so it's maybe like the the courage to quit your job uh and and go to you know, like to to go for your own business or maybe invest your life savings you know like to to put in something that you, it's going to be risky so you have vision you have the courage and then you have the competence which basically is when you combine knowledge and discipline you know like execution is key you know like if you don't uh, maybe you have like if you have like a, a, a an average idea that is well executed it's going to be more successful than a brilliant idea that is poorly executed and sure. yes oh no i don't know if you agree with me but for me, the, mo the most challenging thing is that, uh, as Marisol said, in our countries, we know, we know how to navigate. Then you arrive here, for example, when I opened Brazilian Beat, I didn't know that every January you have to file a 1099 for the, the, the artists that made more than 600, for example. So I was lucky that a colleague like mentioned, oh, I'm doing that. I said, what, what are you doing? And then, you know, we really have to have very good professionals with us. But when you arrive in a new country, a lot of times you don't find right away the good professionals. So I think that the beginning is very hard. Do you agree with me or? I agree, I agree completely. Like not only, Right, like for us, especially like when you come from another country and you're trying to uh, open your own business or, or run something in a different country, of course you have another you know, level of mm -hmm. difficulty because it's, not, it's a different environment, it's a different culture, sometimes it's not your uh, native language. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, 
this is something that, of course, like you need to 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 consider. Uh, I think that you know, like uh, I've been uh, since 1998. I've been you know, like when I opened my first business. Uh, of course, my first business, like it was in Brazil, where I had like I knew the culture, I knew the environment, I knew the language, and my first business wasn't that successful financially. But then from that learning and from that that, that previous experience, I went to my second business where I invested like five thousand dollars at the time, and after thirteen years, I had like more than a hundred million dollars in sales, going like from scratch. So I made it like a nice exit, and then I moved to the U.S. And here, in my first uh, experience here in the U.S., uh, I was trying to implement uh, to bring a restaurant chain to the U.S., like a, to here to the U.S. And the restaurant industry is really tough. We we'll have like some, like, of course, like a, the U.S. We have a lot of competition in every single industry, but like, but the restaurant industry is is the tough industry and it was hard to you know like to, to implement the business here but like but I took the journey to you know like to learn everything that I could and to take the good and the bad experiences and now like with my uh, investment company I have uh, a portfolio of eight business that I've invested and three of those business I'm helping to grow here in the US and we're being successful. One is just beginning, but the other two are already, you know, like starting to 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 move up. And so, you know, like all that, the things that I learned, the the, the failures, the thing, uh, like we, you have to grab and use to 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 be successful in your in your future and next venture. Yeah, we learn every single day here. Exactly. Well. Every show, we will have a subject expert. Our very special guest today is Mr. Andrew Duffel, president of Research Park of the Florida Atlantic University. Duffel's international background and multiple economic development roles have shaped his forward thinking and problem solving approach regarding the development of South Florida's economy using technology as a catalyst. He'll make a short introduction, followed by Q&A. Mr. Andrew Duffel, please. Hi, Andrew. Hello, everybody. I'm so grateful to you for having me, particularly on this very special first edition of the program. Uh, so I'm uh, flattered and, and really excited to join you and how appropriate that you've chosen entrepreneurship to be the first subject that you discuss as a group because uh, the Latin community, both Portuguese speaking and Spanish speaking, is so entrepreneurial, particularly those that have made the trip to emigrate and set up their families and their businesses overseas and, and especially here in the United States. So it's very appropriate and I'm so um, excited to be here and so grateful for our partnership with the Brazilian community, with the Brazilian business group in particular, and obviously as well with uh, Marisol and the His Hispanic Entrepreneurship Initiative. For, as far as the research park at FAU goes, uh, our role and the role of an organization like ours and our international soft landings initiative, which we've called Global Ventures, is to provide the community um, a way, an opportunity to express its creative ideas creating new ventures with novel products and services that enable wealth creation and generate new high paying jobs for more and more residents of our region here in South Florida. So as you might imagine, uh, the research park at FAU focuses on high tech industries. So the jobs that are created by the companies in the research park are sustainable and help diversify our economy beyond the traditional three industries that have been so strong in Florida's history of agriculture, tourism, and real estate development. Now, Florida Atlantic University has developed deep expertise, especially in the last few years, in the areas of healthcare and health tech, uh, sensors and sensing systems, artificial intelligence and big data, as well as ocean and environmental sciences. So it's natural for us as the university's partner to build on their strong foundation. Uh, the research park at FAU is a physical place 
for, for spontaneous collaborations to occur and for our community, our entrepreneurs to try new things. But it's more than a physical place. It's really an idea. It's a, an expression of the region's strategy to be more creative and to diversify its industry. Those things have to happen in a physical place um, by necessity, but that's not what we're there to do. We're not there as a real estate project. We're there as an entrepreneurial initiative that has to happen in a physical place. Um, so we often say that the research park at FAU is South Florida's laboratory. We bring private sector companies to the park and ask them to interact and collaborate with the research faculty at Florida Atlantic University so that they can work on new discoveries, which we can then help them translate into commercial application. In the process, the learning experience for the students of the university, and now there are about 30,000 students, uh, their experience is improved and enriched as they get hired as interns and then later on as employees full time by these companies that we work with throughout the park. Um, we often forget and should remember that FAU, um, one of its greatest strengths is the fact that it is the most diverse university in Florida. It serves African-American students, Hispanic students, students from Asia, from the Caribbean, as well as US students from all across the United States. So that rich diversity really helps to generate new ideas and an understanding of what it takes to be successful in a multicultural environment. So it's a very fertile ground for entrepreneurship and creativity to really be expressed. Um, so they have this opportunity to create their own companies if they're inspired by what they witness in the research park. And there are multiple programs in the university itself for undergraduates and graduate students for the entrepreneurially minded. They can enter a business plan competition, for example, and then have that new entity uh, applied to the Tech Runway Initiative, which is selective, and then get they get mentoring and help uh, to stand the company up and have it become viable over the long term. Tech Runway is a great incubator, not only for students, but also for faculty in the wider community. Um, and people who live throughout South Florida have applied and meet very successful in that program. If an entrepreneur with no existing ties to FAU has a great idea, then she can join Tech Runway in its annual selection process. Where we come in at the research park and, and more specifically with Global Ventures is when a company graduates from Tech Runway and companies like them that are out there in the world and in South Florida, um, they've, uh, they've established themselves, they've proven their market, they've generated some revenues and then started to employ some people. We then have built a system that allows those companies that graduate Tech Runway and others in the community uh, to come to Global Ventures and we facilitate the growth of the companies. Um, we look, like I said, for companies that have generated revenues, usually around a million dollars or so, and have started to employ people, hopefully around 10, whether that's here in South Florida or in their home market in Brazil or in um, in Colombia or, or Mexico, for example, we would look at those companies as success success stories that are ready to be scaled up and take the next step to success with us. We scale the companies up, hoping to make them into multi multi million dollar enterprises that innovate in our community for many years to come. And we're looking for companies all over the United States and from overseas. And that's why we really focused on this being global ventures. We are very cognizant of the fact that the Brazilian community is very strong in South Florida. The Hispanic community is very strong in South Florida because of the proximity of Latin America to us. But European markets are easily accessed. And anybody who's got a great product knows they need to enter the US market to be successful. So we really try to help them land softly. It's a soft landing center and integrate to the business community in South Florida easily all the while focusing on their technology and their company while we, we help them with the administrative things, as you talked about earlier, of preparing taxes and meeting the right people who can be trusted to help them set up the corporation in the right way. Um, so it's a very exciting initiative. It's one we set up and launched last year. Um, we're really looking for companies in that second stage of growth from around the world. We've identified Brazil specifically and Israel as our first markets to engage. And we chose those companies, as I mentioned, for proximity and cultural and linguistic reasons, as well as the tech 
depth, the depth of the tech industry that we see both in various sub-markets in Brazil as well as in Israel. But we're not turning anybody away. We're just going to those two markets as our first foray by ourselves. Um, so we live and breathe and, and experience entrepreneurships every single day at the Research Park at FAU, and it's very, very exciting. How interesting. I wish I would have met you before, <laughs> so we would have done these things, right? We would have, like, the opportunity to practice before we go on real life, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, really good. So now let's begin the Q&A. Taking the lead, Aloysio Vasconcelos, Chairman of Brazil International Foundation. Well, it's uh, pl always a pleasure to be here, to host again, to, to co-host the program with you, Suzanne, and uh, my peers in this, in this case, our friends. Uh, well, a, a bunch, a, a lot, Andrew covered most of, of, the, of the possibilities, uh, but, uh, you know, that uh, I would like to, you know, the room that I had for questions in, in the sense that I am interested in knowing how the research park can help small groups of Brazilians. I'll explain better. We talk about the large number of Brazilians here, 450 about that in Florida. We mentioned that uh, a lot of them are entrepreneurs, and you know, but they have different sides. We don't see here uh, high-level entrepreneurs from Brazil, with few exceptions, like the one that we are having now, João, is here with us. Now, people with good education and good ideas. But uh, it, actually, in terms of ideas, we have people that uh, have them, but they don't know how to do. Of course, we can help. That's what uh, the Brazil, Brazil business business try, is trying to do, but there is a limit. Uh, things become technical at one point, and it has to be like this so we can compete. Uh, do you have a case of, uh, similar to what I'm talking about with this uh, profile, but this is something that, in addition to the company that we know that we can bring to, you know, to help with us in the development here, we can generate groups of people from Brazil and also people that are already here, never forgetting that we, we call Brazilians in general. Uh, what I mean is that the second generation of Brazilians also, are also Brazilians in, the, in this neighborhood, but they are not just Brazilians, they are Americans as well. So they had an education here, they understand the, the environment and they can be very uh, helpful. In this, in this project. So can you talk a little bit about this, uh, how we can uh, not only generate possibilities, but also help them to thrive? Yes, I think that the answer to your question, it really goes to the heart of what we have to offer at the research park at FAU. And, and the secret is in the name. We're not a center that just stands alone. We are able to call upon the resources, the substantial resources of Florida Atlantic University. So if an entrepreneur, whether he or she be here in the United States or in Brazil or in Colombia or in Chile, we are able to pair that person with not only entrepreneurial frameworks at the university, but scientists who can help translate the idea into some working prototype or a computer program that will put that idea, translate it into commercial application. And I really think that that's one of the most important things that we offer our companies. Uh, that's the relationship with Florida Atlantic University. We act, I by no means am a scientist or, or, or even an entrepreneur. I happen to be a facilitator. I can be a gateway to the resources of the university. Um, and and that's, an that's a benefit that our initiative has that I really don't think many others, if any, can offer. Um, so for example, I can tell our newest company um, that is actually from Brazil, uh, a company called Go Awake. 
that is the spin-off of a Brazilian company, Creare Sistemas. Um, they recently arrived here and they have a sensing device for driver behavior. And they've developed their product very successfully in, is, in Israel, in Brazil, um, to monitor drivers of long haul trucks that drive through the Amazon at nighttime and fall asleep. Mm -hmm. so their system alerts the driver that he or she fell asleep and alerts the, the company that they have a bad driver. Um, uh, so here, our challenge in the logistics industry is not so much long distances where people fall asleep, but bad behaviors like texting or smoking or looking out the window or doing other things. So FAU is helping them to adjust their technology to be applicable to the US market. And just by coming here and working with us in the research part, we've able we've been able to plug them into a, a federal uh, grant opportunity of, that's a multi-million dollar opportunity to monitor senior citizens and their driving behavior to start to predict or realize when a driver is becoming too old to drive, that their response times slow down. So just by joining us, this one company from Brazil has been able to plug into a big resource immediately. Um, so I think that's really, really important. Um, secondly, we, we really work with each company to understand their specific needs. Each one is obviously unique. And we have a series of consultants that we work with who, who spend time with them, understanding them and, and really becoming part of their team and then developing um, uh, sales lists for them and developing uh, warm leads for them. Uh, that a company at their stage of development probably wouldn't be able to afford. That's probably fifty, sixty thousand dollars worth of consulting that we are able to provide to the company because they're part of our program. And lastly, I'll just say that you uh, are a, a huge resource to companies from Brazil or or Brazilians and Hispanic entrepreneurs here in Florida. The BBG and HEI and the Chambers of Commerce are part of our network and by your experience we're able to introduce our companies to you to help them not only with the service professional service that you deliver but your life experience as an expatriate and that is also extremely valuable thank you uh, thank you so much andrew now mary Saul, please the research park has companies from other countries. What can we learn from them? Yeah, again, you know, the, the, everything uh, is so interconnected in the entrepreneurship world. Um, we, we originally, certainly when I joined the research park 10 years ago, didn't have a specifically international program. But over time, and uh, many of you know, I have an international background. I'm British. I lived in Spain for many years before I came here. I lived in Italy and I married uh, a Cuban lady. So I have some international experience of my own. So my mind is already in that space. We realized quickly that we already had, without trying, companies attracted to us from Norway and Germany and Spain and, and now Canada and Brazil. And each person, each country uh, brings a new perspective to our individual lives and to the life of the research park as a whole and obviously to global ventures, making it a more vibrant place to work and innovate. So as you all and, and your audience certainly knows well, new people bring new ideas and a vibrancy that helps advance society and make it develop, evolve and thrive better. So there's always something new to learn and, and I think that is multiplied when you bring a company from another country. More generally, I think that we can see that each of these companies understands the value uh, to it of the US market for their own growth. And the US is still the largest and most important market in the world, but others are trying to catch up and they're doing it fast. If we want to retain the position of the first and the most attractive, we have to reinforce and invest in the things that made us attractive in the first place. So we have to continue to invest in federal research opportunities for innovation and growth, like I just described, high quality education from tiny kids through postdoctoral students. These things um, really are important. And of course, high quality infrastructure that makes it possible to conduct business both online like this and in person. Uh, many of these things cost a lot of money, as you well know, and we haven't maintained these assets very well. And so I think we learn from our uh, foreign friends and, and arrivals that uh, 
to be as attractive as we are, we need to continue to invest in, in what made us attractive in the first place. Very interesting. Like um, you only help new companies like, like in the incubator or like companies that are already in the market, but they want to grow and they need more like support faster than, than the other stage. Well, the great thing about what we've developed as an FAU community, uh, and, and I'm not formally part of the university uh, we're a separate organization but we're part of the broader community the great thing about what we've built together is that we can help companies that are an idea in somebody's head and a company that's publicly traded and everything in between so we have uh, the FAU wave program for example for a person who has an idea but doesn't have a prototype so they can learn how to build a prototype and then go to tech run or the business plan competition to figure out how to build financial statements and the business plan and then tech runway to understand what it takes to turn that business plan into reality. And then from there to global ventures and on as the company gains traction and gains customers and revenues. Mm -hmm. Andrew, how is the state of Florida welcoming Brazilian companies on your point of view? Are there like small business loans or something like that that are accessible for Brazilian companies or Hispanic? Well, the, the state of Florida doesn't really differentiate between companies from Brazil or Mexico or the UK or, or Florida. Um, what the state has done, which in my opinion is something very responsible, is to make itself just attractive to do business, period. So mm -hmm. the inherent benefits that we don't really talk about very often, we who live here take it for granted. Um, we have no personal income tax in the state of Florida. So that's a savings over most other states. Um, we have a very low corporate tax rate, corporate income tax rate of five and a half percent that hasn't changed since I've been here for 15 years. Um, uh, but in addition to that, uh, yes, there are resources for small businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, most of them are housed in the small business development centers, and there are eight of those around the state. For Broward and Palm Beach counties, uh, the, the SBDC is housed at the research park at FAU. So our companies have immediate access to all of the consultants. They go next door in the building and, and, and tap on the door. Um, but those resources are available to any business throughout uh, Broward and Palm Beach counties. Um, they help with access to um, not only venture capital, but more normally um, debt financing through banks and revolving loans that are federally guaranteed, for example. So yes, there are resources, but they're not specifically uh, oriented to foreign, foreign owned companies. Oh, great. Thank you. Roberto, you have a no, question. No, you already covered what I was going to ask, because uh, I, I believe, for instance, the SBA is one avenue for uh, funding or not? Yes, uh, the SBA has a number of programs. Some of them are cash flow reliant. Some of them are physical asset, uh, physical asset uh, based loans. Um, all of them uh, directed through private banks, but guaranteed by the SBA and the federal government. So there are many resources available at different levels. Uh, many of the counties in Florida, including Broward and Palm Beach, offer um, opportunities for small businesses to uh, register as small and minority owned businesses and get priority uh, listing for uh, government procurement contracts, for example. And they have training programs to, to teach the entrepreneurs how to make themselves qualify for those uh, opportunities. And many cities and, and other governments have um, regulations in place to make sure that a certain percentage of contracts go to minority and women and, and um, veteran-owned businesses. So there are lots of opportunities that, um, to Suzanne's point earlier, are not widely known. So you really need to access the resources of a small business development center or, or someone like us to help you navigate uh, through the, those systems to make sure that you are well-placed to receive those, um, those opportunities. Um, uh, but there, you know, it gets complicated, you know, talk about taxes and regulation. Uh, you know, those are really complicated. And while, like I said, we're not, and I'm certainly not uh, an entrepreneur or business specialist, we're a network of facilitator. So while we have these relationships with the governments and the Small Business Development Center, we also have a big, deep network of, of service providers 
um, like what some of you do on a professional basis, that we're able to tell our companies, uh, this company is trustworthy. You, you don't have to worry. You know, they're reputable. They know what they're doing. We've done business, business with them for years. So it takes some of the worry away from the, the foreign entrepreneur or entrepreneur from a different state, knowing they're doing business with reputable people in our network. And if I may, uh, you also mentioned venture, uh, venture capital. Uh, how's that work? I mean, uh, is it uh, New York thing that you have to go to, or is it Florida-based venture capitalism? More and more, we're seeing funds um, from other states invest in Florida, but we have a number of, of funds that are based here, particularly uh, the angel level of investment. So. A few hundred thousand to a couple of million dollars could be funded by one of the angel groups in the region. Um, Tech Runway, uh, based in the research park, recently established a um, an investor network. So we we plug into them, and many of our companies have presented to them for that opportunity. The oldest network in the region uh, is based in the research park, New World Angels. Again, uh, a group of about forty angel investors in, in the in the individual independent investors who club together and form syndicates to invest in companies and then uh, over the years even the state of florida has put money aside to invest in promising companies not really at the early stages of development but perhaps once a company has reached a 10 million dollar threshold they could then be invested in by the florida opportunity fund which is run out of orlando for example um, or the Florida Funders, uh, which is in Tampa. There are lots of groups uh, across the across the region. Um, so again, it's good to know someone like us who's been here a long time, who has relationships with all of these different uh, groups, and we can make those warm introductions. Because as you know, if you submit a business plan through a web portal, it gets left in a pile. But if you tell us what your interests are, we can send it to the right group who has the similar interests as you and make that warm introduction, giving you a better chance of success. Okay, and uh, if you make this being some kind of established credibility to the process. I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? I said that uh, these also bring some kind of uh, instant credibility. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. the newcomer. Yes, uh, I think that's an important point, Aloisio, that I didn't mention. Our program is not, you know, you, you can't just show up and, and give us a check. Uh, we have a, a, a rigorous uh, selection process. We, we go looking for companies and, 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 and we vet them. Uh, but companies that come straight to us, uh, all of them have to fill in an application form, give us certain information. So to your point, when a funder is made, if we make an introduction to a funder or even to a service provider, they have the comfort of knowing that we've done a little bit of diligence on the company and just as we're telling the company this service provider or, or funder is reputable, that they in turn know that the company, the newcomer, is reputable and, and someone worth worth investing some time in. Now, João Barbosa, do you have a question for our guest as well? Uh, yes, I do. Hi, Andrew. Uh, uh, we've been listening that Miami is becoming not only Miami but South Florida is becoming an, an important startup startup hub uh, in the U.S. Quite often, you know, like we find uh, Miami listed within like the 15 most important tech hubs in the country. Uh, what could you share with us in regards to this trend? Is it really like consistent? Uh, is it more tech related or uh, other industries, uh, you know, like uh, you mentioned about tax, like uh, state tax, but like what could be, you know, like Miami's or South Florida's uh, differential to continue bringing more companies to the region? Well, Miami really has been the headline, hasn't it? And and people talk about Miami. Uh, it's 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 the the well known city, uh, but we know uh, working here in South Florida that. Uh, much of that tech-related activity is actually concentrated outside of the city of Miami itself and is in the region of South Florida. Um, we're a big region, uh, and Miami, the city of Miami itself, is, is just one component. If you think about some of the most famous success stories of Miami, they're mostly from Broward County uh, and Southern Palm Beach. If you think of Chewy, Magic Leap, 
Ultimate Software, Modernizing Medicine, Shipmunk. These are all companies. The two, the last two came from the research part. Um, they're mostly Broward County companies. Um, it's easier to refer to the whole region as Miami for, for recognition and branding purposes, I suppose. Um, and it's the seventh largest metro in the United States. It, and it's already number one, the number one region in the U.S. for startups, according to the Kaufman Foundation, which measures the rate at which residents in each region of the country form companies and startups. And I think that that, that success that we've already attained can be attributed to the fact that most of the people who live here are from somewhere else. So they're naturally more adventurous and more willing to take a risk. And uh, we're, we're an exciting people here in South Florida. So, you know, there's always something new and someone willing to try something more creative. Um, I do think that the trend is sustainable for a few reasons. One is that um, something that the coronavirus has, the pandemic has taught us, is that you don't have to live in a cold environment with the high taxes to be successful. You know, some people thought they had to go to San Francisco to start their company, but now they're realizing we can live in Florida, communicate perfectly well with your colleagues, your funders and your customers all around the world. So people who thought they had to live in Boston or New York or in San Francisco to be successful in a startup now realize they can be here too. Um, secondly, I think it's much easier to access the Latin American market and the European markets from here, as well as the East Coast of the United States, up to New York and Washington, D.C., from here, from here in, in uh, South Florida. Um, and it's certainly easier to do it from here than it is from California. Um, thirdly, I think that foreign entrepreneurs will continue to see South Florida as a good place to enter the U.S. market. It's easy to get to, like I mentioned. We're multicultural, multilingual. We're all very accepting of all backgrounds and, and everybody else's experience. So um, I do think that there is a possibility that it, it could be sustained. Um, but if we want the trend to continue, um, we have to, like I said earlier, have to invest in more education. Um, and uh, we need to make sure we have those qualified people here so that those companies can employ South Florida residents and be successful. Otherwise, they will go somewhere else. Um, and we need those people, our children, to be taught how to think critically and be innovative so they themselves can form these kinds of companies and continue to make us attractive. Sure. Thank also, the little time difference, right? So that it's Good very point. easy, mm -hmm. like because the West Coast is completely yep. different. Uh, That's very true. Yeah. yeah. So anyone has another question? Or we covered it all well? Like if we stay, like I had a ton of questions, but I don't think our time is good. So thank you so much, Andrew, for, you know, being with us. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. We will be back always on the first Thursday of each month at 2 p.m., bringing a subject of interest to our international communities here in South Florida. A recording of this show will also be accessible on YouTube and Facebook on the Boca Raton Tribune pages. Okay, so thank you very much again, and uh, we will be back next month. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.